How realistic is it that Rod Brindamore will be the next head coach of the Buffalo Sabres? We'll tackle it, among other things, coming up here in the Locked On Sabres podcast. Your Locked On Sabres, your daily podcast on the Buffalo Sabres. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thanks for making Locked On Sabres your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode brought to you by Monopoly Go. I'll admit it, I have a competitive side and it is a big fan of Monopoly Go. The mobile hit twist on classic Monopoly. So join your friends and download Monopoly Go. Now free on the App Store or Google Play. The Sabres are it past all their media availability all the players have talked all of the coaches well I guess none of the coaches all of the management have talked Kevin Adams a little bit earlier in the week and now we head full speed ahead into coach search as well as the playoffs but the playoffs may have an impact on the coach search and we'll talk about that one individual that especially has an impact today and that is Rod Brindamore. We'll start our coach search candidate list with him. The first that we'll get to, the Hurricanes are in the playoffs. They will play the New York Islanders. In fact, that'll be the first playoff game of the postseason, Saturday at 5 o'clock. If you want resolution on Brindamore, you should be rooting for the Islanders. So we'll get to all that coming up on today's show here with Sneaky Joe DiBiase. I got a commentary about Don Granado and Kyle Poso that I want to get to as we got more about players and how they're talking about these things. And then I'll have my postseason picks for the Stanley Cup playoffs coming your way. A Stanley Cup pick that I don't see a lot of, despite the fact that they are one of the favorites to win the Cup. That's coming up here on today's show. If you want to get involved with the show, if you're not already a texter, you can sign up for that by going to joinsubtext.com slash locked on Sabres. This morning on the text line, we were talking about some of the breaking news on the Sabres, starting with maybe on a less serious note, as the Amherst are wrapping up their regular season. Noah Oslin, first round pick of 2022, the 16th pick that they got in the Jack Eichel trade, is going to make his AHL deb- debut Friday night. And he's going to do it on a prospect line. Love that Seth Average is throwing the kids together. He's got Oslin with Yuri Kulik and Isaac Roseanne all on the same line. So if you're a Sabre fan looking for so the future of the team, those three guys there that I'd bet at least one or two of them are going to be full-time NHLers at some point. Uh, so that's tonight as the AHL playoffs get closer. Also, this from Tim Graham of The Athletic, not on the Sabres, but on the Bills. Graham says, and is reporting, that Terry Pagula and the Pagula family are looking to sell 25% of the Buffalo Bills. They have hired a company, uh, Allen & Company is the name of it, to seek a buyer for 25%, a minority owner, a silent partner or a limited partner, I should say, that does not have a controlling interest in the Buffalo Bills. So there are financial questions that will arise out of this news, right? Like what is the money situation for the Pagulas? Is the stadium deal have anything to do with this? There are cost overruns that are the responsibility of the Pagulas. And of course, for our purposes, are the Sabres going to be for sale in any capacity? Not in a controlling capacity. I would obviously, you know, be floored by that, but is part of the Sabres going to become available. Now, Tim Graham did tweet out that he wonders if the same deal does end up happening for the Sabres. The Pagulas, though, did send out a statement confirming the news that they're looking for a limited partner, 25%, or, you know, a chunk of the Bills. Um, They did say that this is the only franchise that this is the deal with. But that's for right now. Maybe we'll get to a point where the same deal gets said about the Sabres, but there's no possibility or potential it sounds like that the Pagulas would give up a controlling interest in either team and obviously would not sell the Sabres but hey I've talked about the Sabres financial situation on this show when we've talked about the news of the Coyotes leaving or the Winnipeg Jets attendance problems and just what is the Sabres business prospects at the moment because it doesn't feel like they make any money at all, if not even hemorrhage money. There's revenue sharing in the NHL, which matters to this equation. Um, 
but I've always wondered about the financial health of the Buffalo Sabres. And here you have the owners. They're selling a quarter of their more valuable asset. I, I'd imagine you wouldn't get anything for the Sabres anyway in this front. Who wants, who wants a non-controlling interest in the Buffalo Sabres? The Bills make money. The Sabres, I, I don't think do. So I don't know why someone would want to get in on that. You know what I mean? Like it just, I, you're not doing it for the profit. Maybe you're doing it because you think you can one day own the team yourself when the Pagulas don't anymore. But I just, I don't, I don't know if that ever happens in the first place and it might be so far in the future. What's, what's even the point? So we'll keep an eye on this story. I don't know that it's going to impact the Sabres directly, but we'll see if it does. It does bring the prospects of an internal budget though. We've wondered about the Sabres being a cap team. Right, And I had wondered if they wouldn't get rid of Don Granato because they owed him a whole contract extension and wouldn't want to pay him to not coach. Um, so, you know, the financial stability of the owners is important to the health of the team, but they're going to get a sweet check for, for 25% of the bills. The, the, the valuation at Forbes makes it seem like they're going to get probably what they paid for the bills back by selling a quarter of the team, maybe a billion and a half dollars. Um, so that'll help the, their liquid financial situation. I'm sure we will get to Rod Brindamore and the playoffs coming up, but I do want to start today's show with the overriding theme of the players this week that continued into Thursday, Dylan cousins, Zach Benson, speaking with the media, a couple of others cousins was really the one though, that fur that pushed along The idea that the Sabres are ready to be pushed. They want to be held more accountable. And what's interesting to me is that from what Cousins said, they're really burying Granado this week, aren't they? They're really scapegoating Don Granado. And I'm not even telling you that that's wrong, right? That... But one, where was this all season? Where was this talk all season that the coach was basically soft? Um, But whatever, whether it's true or not, hearing the players talk about it is such a 180. Like he is being held out. He's gone, right? So, you know, he's the guy, I guess, to, to throw all the blame onto. What is weird to me is that this week, over and over and over again, we have heard the description of Granado basically inferred that he didn't hold the players accountable. He wasn't hard on them. We've heard comments such as we're ready for a coach to hold us accountable, hold our feet to the fire, right? Push us, you know, talk, bringing up Gallant and how he would yell at him on the bench, but would put him back out there because he knew he would get the message. That type of stuff was being said about the coaching staff, but they also said the same exact thing about players holding each other accountable. So that's, Here's where my question lies. I'll bring it up again. I'm beating a de- uh, broken record here, but beating a dead horse here. Playing a broken record. That's what I was looking for. How come we're making the jump when they're talking about the next coach to, oh, well, Granado must not have been doing any of that. But we're not doing it with the player level. We're not doing it with the leadership in the locker room. Okay, I'm okay if you want to blame Granado and, and indict him on not holding players accountable. But they're talking about players not holding players accountable too. Where were the leaders? Where was Kyle Okposo? Where was Zemgis Girkinsons? How come those guys were incapable of holding this young group accountable? Maybe it's just a young group. Maybe they didn't want to have it had happen to them by anybody. But that's the job of the coach is to hold players accountable. That's the job of leaders, especially the ones that have been brought back for that sole reason. They did not bring Kyle Poso back for his play on the ice because he was barely an NHL player anymore. Zemgis Gergens is to a lesser extent, fourth liner. You don't need him for on the ice purposes. Those guys have been held in high regard because of their meaning in the locker room. Their lead by example, set, even though they don't, set an example, guide the young guys along. It does not sound like they did that at all. Maybe they tried, maybe the message wasn't getting through, and maybe they failed the same way that Granado might have. But if you're going to blame Granado for not holding the players accountable, you've got to blame the captain too. 
because they're pointing the finger at both groups, coaching staff and the players. And they're probably talking about themselves, but who was the leader of themselves? Who let them get in a fight with fans during this season when it came to the salutes and it came to the chance of Granado? Who let them do that? Who, who didn't nip that in the bud? Who allowed them to not be focused in practice like Darlene talked about? Who allowed them to knock it off to a good start at training camp like Kevin Adams inferred? Who allowed all that? If you're going to point, all I'm saying, you don't have to point the finger at anybody if you don't want. All I'm saying is if you're willing to point the finger at Granado, you also have to be willing to point the finger at Kyle Poso. To me, it's one and the same. When we come back, Rod Brindamore. How likely is it? What do we need to have happen? His merit as a coach idea and how the playoffs affect this. All coming up here on the Locked on Sabres podcast. We are presented here on the show by Monopoly Go. So I've been told I'm a competitive person. I really have been my whole life. I love playing sports. Um, Okay, well, I do have that competitive side. We all do. And my competitive side is a big fan of Monopoly Go. I'm sure you've heard of it been downloaded by over 150 million people. It's a great twist on Monopoly where you play on not one, but hundreds of Monopoly boards in crazy locations, building up amazing cities that bring you big money. But the best part is messing with my friends. I can charge them rent on my iconic properties, just like classic Monopoly. But now I can also heist their vaults of riches for myself and the leaderboard show me who the biggest Monopoly tycoon is. But it's not just my competitive side that loves it. You can team up with friends and people all around the world and timed tournaments to earn huge awards. So get in the game, join your friends, download Monopoly Go, now free on the App Store or Google Play. Back here on the Locked On Sabres podcast, thanks for making us your first listen every day. Be sure to check out Locked On Sports today as the NFL Draft is within a week. From now, you've got the NBA playoffs starting up as well, as well as the Stanley Cup playoffs. Great. This is one of the best two-week stretches in sports of the year. The start of both playoffs and the draft. Locked on Sports Today. Check it out on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TVs app. Sabres are done for the year. The Carolina Hurricanes are not. Their head coach is in a contract year. Rod Brindamore does not have a contract after this season is over. And it has led to speculation for a year more than a year that he could leave that there's maybe tension with the owner and there's a possibility that he could, he could get out of there. I don't know how likely it is. And I tend to think he'll stay. I, if you, if you ask me where to put my chips, I would bet that he will stay, but until a deal is signed, we have to entertain the possibility that he would leave. So, okay, well, let's talk about it. Rod Brindamore, how likely is it? Why is he a guy we always talk about? And what is the timing of this? Which is a very key part here. But the reason we talk about him all the time is one simple fact. He knows Kevin Adams well. Kevin Adams knows him. They played together in Carolina and were leaders on the Hurricanes for almost seven years. 2001 to 2007, they played through together. Before Adams... I believe got shipped off to Chicago. They know each other well. They're friends. And you would tend to think that Adams would have some idea of the situation in Carolina and how likely it is that they could extract Brindamore out of there. So that's why it comes up. The the idea that it's all based on that relationship. Because there's no, no other merit that would make you think Brindamore would come here. Brindamore, if he gets away from Carolina could probably have any job in the league that he wants. If Toronto gets bounced in the first round and Sheldon Keefe gets fired, Rod Brindamore could get that job. And he'd probably want that job on its own in a vacuum over the Sabre job. There are other jobs out there. The Kings job, that's a playoff team that is currently on an interim coach that he he could have the LA job if he wants. He could have the Sabre job, but the big reason you would think that they're in the game is Kevin Adams. Lean on that friendship, lean on that relationship, and get him to come here and set a culture in the locker room and in the organization. So there's that. What about the timing for Rod Brindamore? This is where it gets tricky. The Hurricanes today, before the playoffs have begun, 
are the Stanley Cup favorites. That's right. The Hurricanes, I think in large part due to an easy path that starts with the Islanders, are have the best odds to win the Stanley Cup. So a lot of things could happen here. They could go out in the first round. If the Islanders were to beat them, which I'm not predicting at all, but if the Islanders were to beat them, you'd have resolution, and you might know within weeks whether Brenda Moore is going to become available and how hard you want to push for him. The alternative, though, is what if Carolina goes on a deep run? Are you willing to wait? Are you willing to put off hiring a head coach until you know for sure that Brenda Moore is not going to become available? So that's a risk because if Kevin Adams has a list and Craig Berube is his backup plan, he might come have to come to a decision. Do I want to push my chips in for Craig Berube? Or do I want to wait for Brindamore? And if he goes deep into the playoffs, by the time I don't get him, if he stays in Carolina, well, now my number two option is long gone because Craig Berube has signed somewhere else. You know what I mean? There is a risk there. As your list gets dwindled down, the longer that Brindamore is in the postseason. So really, you want to be rooting for the Islanders in the first round, even if you know you need more reason than 06. You want to be rooting for the Islanders because Brindamore just would give more clarity to the situation. So that is something that you could kind of go back and forth on. You also can make the case, I guess if you wanted to, that the Sabres should be the team that does take the risk, that they should wait while maybe LA hires a coach if they get eliminated or Toronto if they get eliminated or while Ottawa hires a coach and while all these other teams that need coaches go out and do it, your hope would be you're the last man standing when Brenda Moore gets eliminated. Everyone else has, fought, has hired their coach. You still haven't. Brenda Moore doesn't want to stay in Carolina, and you're the only show in town. That's a part of this game, too. Um, it. I wonder how Kevin Adams wants to play that. You could approach it from different areas. For me, and I think for most, it's hard to argue that there's a better idea. If you could get anybody you want that's realistic, it's hard to come up with a better idea than Brenda Moore. Like, it's a better idea than Lindy. It's a better idea than Barube. It's a better idea than Boudreaux. It's a better idea than all these guys. Brenda Moore has never missed the playoffs. This is his sixth season in Carolina. He had won the division three times and has made the playoffs all six years. 99 points, then he had two short in years, so 81 points in 68 games, 80 points in 56 games, 116 points, 113 points, 110 points. Three straight seasons of 110 plus points of 50 plus wins, and it would have been four in a row because by points percentage, that 80 point year in 56 games was actually his best season. So four years in a row, Carolina have been Arguably the most consistent team in the regular season. Playoffs, they haven't found as much success, but they found some. They've won a couple of rounds. Uh, in fact, if I look at the exact number of rounds, because I only have the games played by playoff uh, by playoff year at the moment. Since Brenda Moore became the coach, they went to the conference finals last year, so that's two playoff series wins. They went to the second round the year before, that's three. They went to the second round the year before that, that's four. And this, the the qualifying round they won the year before that, that's five. And they went to the conference finals the year before that, so that's seven. So seven playoff series wins since Brenda Moore's been the coach. No, he doesn't have a cup, but well, at least as a coach, he does as a player, kind of. We all know we got lucky. Uh, Brenda Moore has the pedigree that Adams was talking about. Um, he is someone that challenges his players. One misnomer that I've seen a lot of when it comes to Rod Brenda Moore, just because a guy holds players accountable or is maybe a little bit more of an old school style coach, doesn't automatically mean that the guy plays a physical brand of hockey. Carolina has a finesse game. They really do. And they have for the whole time he's really been there. He, they have a finesse to their game. That is proven by hit stats. Hits are tricky, right? And they're not always exactly 100% accurate. But go look at who, from top to bottom, had the most and the least hits in the NHL this year. Dead last in hits 
this year, the Carolina Hurricanes. They're not a physical team by any stretch of the imagination. Now, he wants them to work hard, and he wants them to skate hard and to forecheck hard, right? But he's plenty okay with having guys that have speed and skill. He just wants them to also be responsible for the whole length of the ice. Um, maybe this is part of the reason why he probably didn't want a lot of lot to do with coaching Jeff Skinner when he showed up in Carolina, because that relationship ended immediately. So that's another question, too. If Brennan Moore would have come here, would he want them to get rid of Skinner some way, somehow? I could totally see that being the case. But Brennan Moore is someone that goes for the scoring, goes for the offense. He doesn't need his team being overly physical. Again, dead last in the league in hits this year was Carolina. So there's no idea that beats Brenda Moore. The problem is it just doesn't seem all that realistic. There's such a good chance he just stays in Carolina. And again, if he does leave, you're banking on him and Adams being that tight. Because otherwise, um, he could have, I think, any job in the league that he that he probably wants. All right, there's a little bit on Brenda Moore. We'll talk Lindy on our next show because everyone loves talking Lindy. When we come back, though, my Stanley Cup playoff picks stay tuned here on the locked on sabers podcast we are presented here on the show by policy genius policy genius is the country's leading online insurance marketplace saves you time and money so you can provide your family with a financial safety net starting today policy genius helps you compare your options from top companies and their team of licensed experts on hand to help you talk it through it talk to a team of award-winning agents they'll walk you through the process step by step easily compare quotes from america's top insurers in just a few clicks to find your lowest price policy genius gives you unbiased advice from a licensed expert support team check life insurance off your to-do list in no time with policy genius head to policygenius.com such locked on nhl or click the link in the description to get your free life insurance quotes and see how you could save it's policygenius.com slash nhl Back here on the Locked On Sabres podcast, we are approaching the Calder Cup playoffs where we'll spend plenty of time in the Amherst and we're all in on this Sabres coaching search. But also, we've got the Stanley Cup playoffs. I've got my Stanley Cup playoff picks for the 2024 playoffs that will begin on Saturday with Islanders and Hurricanes at 5 o'clock. And then you'll also have Leafs and Bruins at 8, which will be an exciting series. That I'm looking forward to. All right, here are my Stanley Cup playoff picks. Uh, if you want to watch along the show and check my bracket out visually, be sure you can always check out our YouTube channel. Uh, just go to YouTube, search Walk on Sabres, and you'll easily find it. All right, starting with round one. Round one, I think we got some really, really cool matchups in round one. And I'm going to kick things off in the East. The Atlantic Division, the Sabres Division. I'm going to go Florida to win in five over Tampa Bay. Florida is built for the postseason. They went all the way to the Stanley Cup final last year. They are fast. They are physical. They are going to push you around. Matthew Kachuk leading the way on that. And they are a team that has career seasons all over the place. Sam Reinhart, the headliner there, with 58 goals, the former Sabre. And Sergei Bobrovsky finally proved last year that he could that he could stay in uh, or could play well in the playoffs. So I'm going Florida to win this in five. I think Tampa is old. I think Tampa is thin compared to what they've been in the past. I think Florida runs rough shot over Tampa Bay in this series. I've got the Panthers winning in five. Boston and Toronto. Fun, fun fact of the day. The Maple Leafs have not beat the Bruins in a playoff series since 1959. And they've played in the playoffs a lot. It always ends up being a heartbreaker for Toronto. How could you possibly think Toronto's going to win this series? We've never seen it. We've never seen them win that series. I've got Boston winning it in seven, as they should. They'll win it. The Leafs will lose in heartbreaking fashion, as they almost always do. I know they got over the hump last year in the first round, but they got quickly stomped out in round two after they made it. I don't think the Leafs are built for the playoffs. I don't think they... I think their answer of adding guys like Ryan Reeves is not the solution. I think Toronto's going to lose in game seven against Boston in round one. All right, round one in the Metro division. I've got the Rangers sweeping the Washington Capitals. At our partners over at FanDuel Sportsbook, the Islanders have the second longest Stanley Cup odds at plus 5,500. The Capitals are plus 18,000 
in last. The Capitals are almost three times less likely to win the Stanley Cup than any of the other 15 teams, including the New York Islanders, by the betting odds. The Capitals are bad. Worst goal differential in 30 years. They're one of the worst playoff teams we've ever seen. They got lucky goaltending that started to fall apart down the stretch. They're very thin. Ovechkin's a little bit old. Of course, I think they're going to get swept by the Rangers, and it's going to be quick work there. Hurricanes and Islanders, root for the Islanders if you want Brindamore to become available, but I don't think you're going to get your wish. I think the Hurricanes are loaded. I think they are too good for the Islanders. The Islanders are old. They are defensive. Carolina can play that style if they need to. Uh, maybe not physically, but they definitely can defensively. I've got the Hurricanes winning this series in five games, advancing to the next round. In the West, Jack Eichel's Vegas Golden Knights against the Dallas Stars. I think Dallas, with the most points in the West and the second most points in the NHL, are loaded too. I'm going to go with the Dallas Stars. Joe Pavelski is, a, is doing something that you rarely ever see. Big numbers at 39 years old, approaching 40. How often does a guy score 60-plus points, 27 goals, and what, his... 18th year in the NHL. Uh, Wyatt Johnston turned into a very good player this year at his age 20 season. He's very young still. Jason Robertson's a superstar. They've got a great goaltender. I like everything that Dallas has going on. They've gotten younger in recent years other than Pavelski. I think they'll beat the Golden Knights in a close seven-game series. Colorado and Winnipeg in the uh, Central Division. That side of the bracket, so much stronger than the other side. Dallas is great. Vegas is great. Winnipeg's very good. Colorado's great. I have full faith in Connor and uh, excuse me, Kel McCarr and Nathan McKinnon. I think it's the best duo I've arguably ever watched in the NHL. I love McKinnon. I love McCarr. They are built for each other. They're, in my opinion, the second best center in the sport and the best defenseman in the sport. They've got good pieces around them. Middle stat has helped their center depth as he's come in. I don't really think they're missing Bo Byram all that much. So, I'm going with Colorado to win that series in six. I think Winnipeg is just a goaltender and not a ton else. They have some nice players, but I think they're way too reliant on their goaltender, and I think Colorado will find the answer to Connor Hellebuck. The other side of the bracket, I think, is pretty easy. Edmonton should run through that side of the bracket. I've got Edmonton beating L.A. in five games. I've got Nashville upsetting the Canucks in seven. I think the Canucks are a little bit fake. Um, and Nashville's been hot second half of the year. I like Soros to match that for Demko. I think Nashville can beat them in seven. I'm going with the upset there. I've got in the East, round two, Florida versus Boston, Rangers versus Hurricanes. I'm going Florida over Boston. I think they're a more complete team. I think they're much better down the middle, and they'll win that battle. And then I've got the Rangers beating the Hurricanes um, to make it a Rangers-Panthers uh, conference final. I like the Hurricanes and Rangers almost exactly the same roster-wise, but it's Igor Shosturkin versus Freddie Anderson. I trust Igor Shosturkin more. On the Western side, Dallas versus Colorado, Nashville versus Edmonton. I'm going with the Stars. I'm going with the individuals. The best players in the league are Nathan McKinnon, Kale McCarr, and Connor McDavid. I trust that those three are going to push their teams through. It's going to be Colorado, Edmonton in the conference final, and Florida versus New York. I think Edmonton finally gets over the hump. I think they finally make it all the way to the Stanley Cup final. I think McDavid gets his first chance in a championship round. I think the Rangers are going to make it through Florida in the conference finals. And that gets me to an Oilers Rangers final. I'm going to pick the New York Rangers. I believe they are the most complete team in the NHL, given what their goaltending situation is. Um, Rough. And you know what? Even if I want to debate it. it. Depends how I feel day to day. So they're in a tier of the most complete teams. They have the one of the easiest paths. And I think it is the easiest path because they begin with such a pushover in Washington. They have a chance of playing the Islanders around two, which would be easy also. But Carolina in the second round is not easy, but it's that Capitals first round matchup. I'm so confident they're going to get through that. I think they can build some momentum off that and make a deep playoff run. I got the Rangers winning the Stanley Cup. All right. It's going to do it for us today here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. Enjoy the playoffs. We'll start getting into the AHL playoffs as the Amherst season ends as well. And we'll have some fun with the coach search 
We'll talk Lindy Ruff next time here in the Locked On Sabres podcast. Be sure to check out Locked On Sports today, not just for Stanley Cup playoff action. You got NBA stuff, uh, NFL draft stuff as well, YouTube or on the Amazon Fire TV channels app. Talk to you next week here on the Locked On Sabres podcast.